Piracy has become a worldwide problem. It's the equivalent of an act of robbery or criminal violence at sea through illegal use of force by non-state agents. Modern pirates are still involved in looting and hijacking ships for ransom. But as technology has progressed, their ways of operation have also changed. So how do we deal with them? And where does piracy end and terrorism begin? Today, Tactics is talking with Mr. Scott Breckenridge, Associate Lecturer in Maritime Security and Terrorism at the Dartmouth Centre for Sea Power and Strategy at the University of Plymouth. Mr. Breckenridge, good day to you. Good day to you. I trust you well. Very well, thank you. And uh, thank you for taking the time to do this. So where do you begin to negotiate a mandate to address a transnational terrorist threat such as piracy? I think the key to the key to addressing piracy always has been and I think always will be is on the land. There are certain reasons why people take up piracy, but every single one of them is addressed by addressing the problem on land. Mm -hmm. It's not pirates once they've committed a crime don't stay at sea. They come back to land. They leave from land and they come back to land. And that is very first point of call. The instance in the case in Somalia where the international maritime community put to sea to try and put an, put an end to the piracy I think was slightly flawed and that there wasn't as much effort put alongside put shoreside and that primarily was maybe due to a little bit of mistrust so that in a nutshell addressing piracy begins at on land and it ends on land. Okay, um, I mean, it seems like in regions like the Sahel and in West Africa, there are terrorist organizations that are taking much of their revenue from organized crime or from trafficking in people mm -hmm. and substances. So if you can't really draw a line between organized crime and terrorism on land, why is it so easy to draw that line when it comes to piracy? Under UNCLOS, United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, there is a very definite definition of what piracy is. And that definition revolves around 12 mile limit. If an incident happens within a 12 mile limit, it's armed robbery. If it happens out with the 12 mile limit in international waters, then that is most definitely piracy. But I think as, as far as the seafarer is concerned, it's of no consequence where it happens to them. They've still been the victim of crime, whether it's at sea or whether it's alongside. Mm -hmm. do, do you think there should be a... Sorry, go ahead. And also, piracy's quite a specialist skill. Although terrorists and pirates coexist alongside each other, pirates tend to coexist underneath terrorism. They're allowed to operate under the terrorists who seem to hold the upper hand. And there, there are a few instances of terrorists who've attempted piracy, notably ETA, the Basque separatist region, mm -hmm. but with very little success. And in terms of criminality, I think piracy is a very bespoke subject and it's not something that any criminal or any terrorist can take up which is why that piracy is very, very, very definitely a kind of bespoke area of criminality because of the extra additional skills required. When you say extra additional skills? Seafaring, mm -hmm. navigation, uh, boarding. At, at certain times throughout Somalia history, they were actually running piracy schools right. and they were teaching such things as teaching weapons, teaching tactics, teaching boarding um, uh, and the like, which is all additional to terrorism, which is its own skill set, but you need extra skills to become a pirate. Mm -hmm. There are the kind of the three, in Somalia there was three kinds of pirates. There was the young, the young guns from Mogadishu who knew the weapons, there were the seafarers from Puntland who knew the sea, who knew boats. And then there were the, the technicians 
they were just basically the people who had the GPS and the radios. So there was the, the three, the combination of the three of those protagonists made for a good modus operandi in the piracy world. Mm -hmm. Do you think there should be a UN mandate equivalent to the UN peacekeeping forces that are inland? Well, to stop short of a UN mandate, there is EU, NAVFO, mm -hmm. operated uh, East Africa. There's the Far East, um, the, the geography of the Far East kind of lends itself to piracy because you've got the Malacca Straits and the Singapore Straits, where you've got different states in the north and different states in the south who historically didn't always collaborate, but they have gotten a lot better at collaboration. And in West Africa, the Gulf of Guinea is made up of something like 12 different states who until recently-ish didn't always talk to each other and didn't always cooperate. So there's, in the, in, the, in the West, you've got the Gulf of Guinea cooperation. In the East, you've got EU NAFO, which stops short of UN. And that was primarily because every vessel that comes out of China heads through Malacca, heads across the Indian Ocean and up the Red Sea before it either comes into United Kingdom or Northern Europe. So there was a vested interest, a very big vested interest in Europe trying to put um, piracy to bed. But I think, I, I don't quite understand why there isn't a UN mandate because the IMO, International Maritime Organization, is a body of the UN, situated in London, where the UN's in New York. So it is a UN interest, but, well, as was proven, East African piracy is just about dead. And that was, put to bed by the EU, plus the likes of uh, some Far Eastern companies, countries, but primarily the, the EU navigation force, put piracy down to um, the odd sporadic incident. So there was no need for the UN. I see. Um, you briefly mentioned before the uh, pirate schools. So the so-called pirate schools, let's, let's say. So, has, do you think that technology has changed the way the pirates are doing things right now? I mean, how do we deal with this if it has? Well, what, one, of the, uh, one of the security measures put in place post 9-11 was that all vessels should, of 300 gross tons should carry AIS. And AIS simply tells, it tells everyone, pirates included, where a ship is going to, where it came from, and what it's carrying, with how many passengers, how many crew, nationalities of crew. So all that open source information is equally available to pirates as it is to anyone else who's got a vested interest. And uh, there are case stories of pirates using it to intercept vessels, because mm -hmm. if a vessel says it's coming from Egypt and it's going to the Far East, they know the route so they can intercept it. So in a lot of instances, um, with the master's express permission and for good reason, AIS can be switched off. A lot of masters reluctant to switch off, so they just put the absolute bare minimum into the system. Uh, another technical measure that pirates used is GPS just handheld, simple, double A size battery, handheld GPS, which will tell them where they are and give them bearings to where they're going. So in, in terms of technology, there isn't actually a great deal of technology used in piracy. If anything, you could say it was the other end of technology and it was just very, very basic ladders to climb, bamboo poles to climb, uh, basic assault rifles, very, very limited in technology. So it's not a technological industry. The very fact that it works so well is that there's not a lot of technology required. It's just a man and a gun and a boat. <laughs> um, do the pirates choose specific vessels or just? 
I think um, opportunistic pirates just attack a vessel that's passing. Uh-huh. And if that vessel happens to look like it's got a good security posture, they'll just wait on the next one to come along. Um, in the Far East, I th- yes, definitely they, they are um, selected specifically. Selected, um, but I, th- I think on the whole, it tends to be opportunistic, and it's vessels that are that look weak in posture and don't have a good security footing, and it's human nature. Why would pirates attack a vessel that's going to shoot back at them? They just wait until the next one comes along that doesn't have any defensive measures or any security on board. Hmm. What makes someone be a pirate? <laughs> they they like Johnny Depp. <laughs> uh, you 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 may well laugh, but um, every single time I ever briefed a crew, then that was the notion they had in their head that it was uh, Jack Sparrow, Johnny Depp, and Car- Pirates of the Caribbean, which three hundred years ago was the case. Mm-hmm. But certainly um, East Africa and West Africa were people surviving on one dollar a day. The lure of piracy is kind of up there alongside football stars and movie stars and the rich wealth that goes with it. And certainly um, I read a quote quote from um, Boya, who's one of the, the granddaddies of piracy in East Africa. He said, we're more afraid of hunger than we are of security forces because they, they have got nothing. And in East Africa, they had their wealth. The fishing was decimated by the international community. And for, for most people in the world, having fish as a main course is a choice. For East Africa, having fish is a, ba- a staple. and Without it, they don't eat. So they were more afraid of hunger. And again, in West Africa, where the multinational oil companies make money, but they don't, they live on a dollar a day, is poverty, I think. If you could pin it to one single thing, I think it's, it's poverty and the inability to feed your family through traditional methods. So you take to piracy, which has got lucrative rewards for not a lot of outlay, but possibly millions from a hijacking. Scott Breckenridge, thank you for your time. Absolute pleasure.